Welcome to the Minimum Française. I'm Shannon here. I'm the director here, and I'm really pleased and honored to welcome you to this talk by uh, Rabbi Patrick Montaigne about what Jewish identity is not. Um, I'd like to thank the Knapp Family Foundation and uh, President Charlie Knapp for making it possible to to have this event this evening. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, really pleased to welcome Rabbi Nefi Kalmiya back to New York, where she's on familiar terrain in New York City. She studied and was ordained at the Hebrew Union College of Jewish Institute of Religion in 2008. She grew up in France, actually in the town of Nancy, and moved to Jerusalem at age 17, where she studied life sciences at Hebrew University. <coughs> and then uh, came to study here, and then after being ordained in 2008, returned to Paris, where she leads a congregation, and is also a co-leader of the liberal Jewish movement in France, the Mouvement du Fédéral de France. Rabbi Oliver is currently one of only three female rabbis in France, and actually could not have been ordained there. She, she um, had to be ordained outside of France. And she is um, also married and a mother of three, and is a very important, public voice for progressive Judaism and feminism in a country where Orthodox Judaism still predominates and progressive forms of Judaism don't have the same strong presence that they have here in the United States. One of several books she's published is called In a Birthday Suit, Feminism, Modesty, and Judaism, which discusses representations of nudity and modesty in the Bible. And another book is called How Rabbis Make Children, Sex, Transmission, and Identity in Judaism, which has learned that her books have been translated into a number of languages, but not into English. So um, if any of you have ideas about how to, how to find um, a, a publisher for her books here, I think that would be wonderful. Maybe we, we could look at Columbia University Press, for example, as, as one place. <laughs> Rabbi Ogino is engaged not only as a rabbi and an author, but as a public intellectual. And as you know, France has a strong tradition of public intellectuals. But national debate there is really dominated by secular thinkers. She believes that religious thought as a living tradition has an important contribution to make in contemporary society isn't, and isn't shy to say so. As the Washington Post put it in the title of their profile about her, quote, in secular France, a female rabbi dares bring religion into public life. She is, among other things, a strong voice for interfaith dialogue, in particular the dialogue between Jews and Muslims, and she co-authored a, a book, a dialogue with Rashid Benzin called A Thousand and One Ways to Be Jewish or Muslim. She's also the editor of a journal called Tinwa, which brings together art, current events or politics, and Jewish thought, often around burning social issues, including immigration, homosexuality, and environmentalism, for example. So we're really so, so pleased and honored to welcome her to speak to us tonight at the Museum of and I want to thank you so much for making the effort to be here. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, a few years ago, I moved to New York uh, for my public studies. And um, at the time, I used to have always with me a small notebook. Uh, and I wrote down there all the weird American expressions <laughs> I encountered, you know, things I did not learn at school in English classes. And one of my ve very favorite discoveries then was the wonderful expression, excuse my French. <laughs> so I have no clue uh, why you where you got this expression from, that the idea that French people use dirty words is kind of uh, out of the view. But I found it quite nice. And uh, thinking about it, I almost entitled a uh, tonight lecture Identity, excuse my French. <laughs> um, because you and me have to admit that somehow, on both sides of the ocean, in your country and in mine, the word identity has become somehow a bit obscene, almost a dirty word. Politics of identity, uh, in France we talk about identitarian groups, etc. What do we mean when we talk about identity? Why is it that people 
who very often don't share much or even stand on the opposite side of political spectrum, champion it or transform it, this quest into their absolute backbone. Their identity becomes the core of their political, social, educational, or religious agenda. For some, it's about keeping it, protecting it by all means from the threat of contamination, invasion, pollution of their nation. It's a lot, a lot of shun in the same <laughs> sentence. For others, it's about reclaiming the identity of the past, of their ancestors, of their original tribe that needs to be re-owned or purified or decolonized from what prevents it from being fully itself. And maybe we'll get back to this later. With this question left open, what does it mean to be fully yourself? What does it mean to be authentically you? But first, I'd like to start with a joke. It's not particularly a Jewish joke. It could be. You know, the Talmud said that, um, says that you should always start a speech with what it calls milad dichuta, a word of humor. Because in a way, it teaches your audience that just like in Jewish humor, where a word can mean something and something else, Jewish humor is an art of misunderstanding and of multiple meanings. So actually, the rabbis say that when you teach, you need to be fully aware that you're going to say something that can also be heard differently. It's like starting your speech with a recognition that what you're trying to say is not necessarily exactly what the other <coughs> will understand from it. What you can say is always larger than what you want to say. So the joke goes like this. Um, one day, a little boy comes to his mother and asks her, Mommy, tell me, where do I come from? How was I born? And the mother replies, well, my love, it's very simple. God created Adam and Eve, placed them in the garden. They had children, who were children, who were children, until you were born, my love. So the child is not totally satisfied. He goes to his father and asks him, Daddy, tell me, where do I come from? And the father tells him, my love, it's very simple. At the beginning, there were apes, monkeys, gorillas, and chimpanzees. And the species evolved, and men appeared. They had children, who were children, who were children, and there you are. So now the little boy is totally lost. He gets back to his mother and he tells her, what's the story? You tell me about Gordon, Adam, and Eve, and daddy tells me a story of chimpanzees and gorillas. I don't get it. And the mother responds very calmly, my love, it's very simple. I told you about my side of the family. <laughs> I told you about this <laughs> So this story is actually much more philosophical <laughs> than it appears. And I believe it could be a nice introduction to our discussion tonight about identity. Because what we experience at some point in our life is precisely what the little boys of this story go through. Each one of us needs to navigate and find its way in between counter-narratives, in between opposing versions of our history, of our origins. Those narratives are often irreconcilable, or at least they don't fit well with each other. But both tell something about our truth, about what we call our identity. And this is where I think we can start to point the problem. On this notion, starting even from its etymology, the word identity suggests that something in me is identical to what was or to what will be. Identity is the name of the unmoved or unmovable in me. It's an item or a story that supposedly is transmitted over time and generations as a sameness an identical feature, and you are faithful to it if it remains unchanged, or at least this is how people very often relate to it. This is what they mean when they say, this is how we always did, this is how we always dressed, this is how we always voted, etc., etc. But things are always more complex, just like the little boy in this story. Each one of us 
is the product of dissonance, cognitive or emotional dissonance, the fruit of multiple anchoring, competing narratives that guarantee, supposedly, for each generation, the possibility of a non-identity to their origin. And I do believe we are always the subtle product of irreconcilable versions of our past. And we build ourselves upon this in-between. I'll try to illustrate it with a very personal story that I'll share with you. This is the moment I can have a free therapy session, so I thought I could use it. A few months ago in Paris, I, I gave an interview um, for the newspaper Le Monde in a column that appears weekly in the newspaper. And the journalist in this column always asks the same thing to different person. She asks you to start your story with this sentence. I wouldn't be here if. And then you have to complete the sentence. This is quite an interesting exercise, actually. I invite you to try it at home. I wouldn't be here if. If I had the choice, I wouldn't be here. No. So I wouldn't be here if. Immediately when I thought about how I would continue the sentence, came to my mind a childhood memory. My brother is in this room, so he will probably feel connected to this story. A story which in a way it constitutes a repetition, but not as funny. A repetition of the little boy's story that I told you. I told the journalist on that day that I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been raised in the shadow of two radically different stories and heritage. I happened to be the child of two parents who's, who had very different experiences or their families had very different experiences during World War II. On one side, my father's family was saved by righteous among the nations, saved by people who risked their lives and hid them, and my family remained very deeply grateful for this bravery and also confidence that you may encounter in your life and on your journey, people who embody dignity and courage. And um, on the other side of my family, my mother's parents did not have this luck and they experienced deportation and the extermination of their family. And after the war, they attempted to rebuild the family, but they remained all their life in an absolute lack of confidence in the other, as this other, the neighbor, the relative, the friend, could one day become your murderer. And I clearly remember, as a child, perceiving the rift between these two ways of considering the surrounding world. And very early, I had to journey between two opposing views, wondering, was my neighbor a savior or a killer? Was he worthy or not of confidence? And beyond that, how could I reconcile narratives with no intercrossing paths? How could I grow upon the discrepancy between these founding narratives of my past? I'm convinced today that this in-between um, counter storytelling inside me had a lot to do with the person I became, had a lot to do with the rabbi I became, and I would say also had a lot to do with the reader I became. Because as you know, at the core of religious interpretation stands the question of multiple meanings contradictory meanings, the text can be interpreted in this way or in another way, there is a possibility to make sense of its lacks, of its internal failure and incoherence. And it's particularly true, particularly true if you read that text in Hebrew, because as you probably know, know Hebrew is a consonantic language. Each word can be pronounced a way or another way, so therefore it can always mean something and something else, and sometimes the opposite. And the reader needs to deal with the fact that the text can always mean beyond what it seems to mean. And the reader is therefore placed in a position of responsibility. What will he choose to read in the text that could easily be read differently? And to go back to the boy's story, how will he make sense simultaneously of mommy's and daddy's version? And more importantly, how will he get to understand that he is the child of both, but yet is free to interpret it in a different manner. This is the real, I think, maybe the ideal reading experience. But of course, things don't always go this way, and very often people 
imagine, imagine that the voice of past <coughs> readings is the only legitimate voice, and that they are only entitled to repeat what has been said. They believe that the text has already spoken. Everything has been said. Nothing can be new under the sun. And they see themselves as kind of keepers of past times or traditions. What does this have to do with the identity issue and the actual obsession around this notion in the religious realm and in the political realm today? Well, if you pay attention to the slogans that won almost all the elections in the past years, they do share a lot um, in ideas and languages. When Donald Trump puts forward his line, make America great again, he echoes, in a way, um, the slogan of the pro-Brexit camp. You may remember in Great Britain, the slogan was take back control. In both cases, the promise is to bring back what used to be. And it doesn't really matter that no one knows precisely when was the great time we talk about or when exactly we were in control. The plan is to bring you back the past into the future. It's the absolute definition of what nostalgia is. Um, a way of saying once upon a time, it was good. The present is just a declined version of the past. So let's go back to what was. And this political nostalgic discourse gets its epitome, its strongest version, in fundamentalistic discourse, religious discourse. Fundamentalism claims that fundamentals of the past should be reclaimed. It's always about the good old days, the memory of the golden age that we have betrayed. And we say, remember the days of old, remember when the prophet was here, remember when the temple was here, remember when the authority in the family was clear, etc., etc. But, thus they say, something got wasted or polluted or diluted with time, sometimes with bad influence, modernity, enlightenment, feminism, and other terrible things. <laughs> and, and one should aim for purification from these influences. And this is the key word, purity. Purity. And all these discourse have an issue with impurity, impurity of belief and impurity of bodies. Most of the time, feminine bodies that represent more than anything else the openness or the porosity of frontiers, possible contamination and therefore possible change. And always the religious discourse of nostalgia of the past encompasses the idea of being faithful to what was against what could be, trying to create an identicalness as a marker of identity faithfulness. When I started to study this question through the lens of Jewish text and through the lens of literary, literary tradition, I faced an interesting paradox, and I'd like to describe it for you now. All the heroes um, in sacred text, and the rites, actually, tell a story of identity building that could almost be described as the opposite to the one I just mentioned. In the sacred text, we are constantly told that identity depends on the forbidden repetition of what was. Let me give you a few examples. Let's start with the most famous parent in Jewish history, or even the most famous parent in monotheistic tradition, the father figure by excellence. For all those who claim to be uh, his children, I'm talking, of, of course, about Abraham. Um, Ibrahim, Abraham, is the, the father, represents fatherhood. It's even his name in Hebrew, Abraham. Uh, father of many, elevated father. One day, as you remember, he hears this incredible call, Lech Lecha, go for yourself, says the Hebrew, leave your homeland, the place of your birth, the house of your father, and go to the land I will show you. That's maybe the most famous call in the Bible. Abraham leaves the place of his origin, and he cannot go back. He should never come back to his original land. By the way, this is the big difference between the Greek mythology of Ulysses 
and the Jewish story of Abraham. Ulysses desperately wants to come back to his country, but Abraham should never come back. In this journey, we should pay attention to two different interesting ideas, because I think they are very subversive ideas. The first one could almost be a joke. Among all the heroes of the Bible, we chose as the ultimate father figure, the only character who truly run away from his father. <laughs> and therefore, the challenging question is this one. What does it mean? What does it mean to be the children of Abraham? Does it mean that you need to obey him as a father figure and never challenge his authority? Or does it mean you have to have the same chutzpah <laughs> that was his and to do to Abraham, in a way, what he did to his own father? The second message is more specifically to do with Jewish identity and the way uh, it defines itself. Abram leaves his birth land and becomes the first Hebrew, and literally Hebrew means in Hebrew, to cross over, to pass. So it's a very, very weird name to carry. Because when someone says he's Greek, it means he comes from Greece. When someone says he's Roman, it means he comes from Rome. But to say you are a Hebrew doesn't say where you come from. It says nothing about the world of your origin, but everything about the fact that you left it. So the Hebrew identity is the identity of someone who is not identical to the place where he was. The Hebrew identity is an identity of not being anymore where you were. You are what you are because you are not where you were. <laughs> so you have to admit, we're kind of far from the discourse of nostalgia we described before. Let's continue our fast track exploration of other biblical texts and identity building episodes in the Bible. It's pretty interesting, you know. If the father figure in the Jewish narrative is Abraham, then who is the mother? Interesting question. For the rabbis, the mother of the Jewish people is not a character, not a matriarch, not a prophetess, but a country. The motherly country for the rabbis, the womb of the Israelites in the Bible, is Egypt. And you remember, of course, this episode, because you all saw the Prince of Egypt one day. The Israelites that are slaves in the Egyptian womb, but the way it's described in the Bible goes like this. <coughs> the seeds of Jacob are growing fast until Egypt is too narrow to hold them, and then starts the pain of labor, the painful process of deliverance for the baby people, in the painful contractions that strike Egypt for 10 plagues. And finally, they're about to be expelled, but first, as you remember, the amniotic sac of the Sea of Reeds needs to be split. You know the story. For the rabbis, in many ways, it's a birthing account, almost a surgery by an obstetrician god who gives birth to a free people. And again, what I'd like you to pay attention to is the idea, is this idea that an identity, in this case, does not come from an origin, in this case, from Egypt, but from an exile, from a movement out of an origin. And I could go on and on with so many biblical examples, the names of the, that the Jews give themselves as the children of Israel or as Hebrews in the tradition or in the Bible, always come from narrative of movement and not from narratives of settlement. Even the name Israel, Israel, for instance, the very name of that people, comes not from the land of Israel. It comes from this famous episode of fighting, like the biblical Krav Maga episode, um, when you probably remember this, Jacob meets an angel one night, he fights against him until dawn, and then Jacob is injured in his hip socket, he gains a new name, but he will limp, he will limp, to say again, he will limp for the rest of his life. What does it mean exactly to limp? It means that he will never be able again to stand 
still. That's what happens to you when you're late. You cannot stand still without movement. So his balance from now on depends on his ability to be in a state of in between. I'm here, I'm there, and I'm here, and I'm there, and my balance depends on the movement. I think that this is actually what Jewish identity is very often about. It's a paradoxical. As paradoxical as it sounds, it's an identity, according to Judaism, that is always in a state of limping. It cannot replicate simply because it cannot stand still. It's defined by the movement between where you were and where you might go. And it's essentially non-essential. It's, it's a becoming. Think about it. In Hebrew, the verb to be doesn't exist in the present tense. You can't be. You might have been. You may become, but you cannot be. <laughs> in a word, it's an impossible identity. If you believe, an identity is a repetition of what was or an unmoving part of yourself. And this is, by the way, why no one knows how to define who a Jew is. For some, you know, a Jew is someone who is born of a Jewish mother or father or someone who converts to Judaism. And for others, it's someone who lives according to Jewish principles of rules, feels connected to the Jewish people. Some commentators suggest that you are Jewish if you have Jewish children or Jewish grandchildren. Others, like for example, uh, Amos Oz, the Israeli author, says something very wise. He says, you are Jewish if you are crazy enough to say you are. <laughs> um, the inability to define once and for all what is a Jew has to do precisely with everything we talked about. A definition by definition, creates a finition. It puts an end to the discussion and to the movement. Or to say it differently, how do you define your identity when your identity is based upon the idea that it's not identical to your inherited identity? You have two hours. Now I think some of you have a headache and it's okay. <laughs> Other may wonder what all this has to do with ongoing debates and political discourses about identity and what we experience here in America, you experience here in America, and I experience in Europe. Or we experience pretty much all over the world these days. That's what I'm going to try to explore now. We live, we live a weird moment in history, I believe. Let's face it. There are two opposing narratives that are particularly strong voices in our societies. On one side, there is this nostalgic discourse, religious or political, that we already mentioned. It's a will to say it used to be better before, so let's go back to what was. But on the other side, there is an incredibly strong, <coughs> innovative discourse that you're familiar with. We live in a world of programmed obsolescence yeah. all, around, all around us. Recently, I, I read a study about the fact, I talked about it yesterday at the French consulate, I read a study about the fact that um, one word almost entirely disappeared from political platforms and from firm vision in recent years. That word is the word progress. Progress <coughs> has been replaced by the word innovation. But progress and innovation are not the same thing. Progress means that there is a certain continuity in time between the word that was and a better place that could be or that will be. And innovation, on the contrary, implies no continuity. On the contrary, it says, let's break free from what was. Let's, let's make tabula rasa. Let's invent a new world and declare that the old one is kind of obsolete. Innovation pretends you can almost invent yourself anew and ignore what was before. And indeed, in a way, many people today, and I feel the discussion is maybe stronger in America than in Europe, many people say they can decide totally what is their identity by themselves, their gender, their age, their color, without any connection with what has been decided for them or said about them in the past. And it's a form of tabula rasa, a radical disconnection from past assignments. And these two discourse, 
are somehow two sides of one medal. One says, the past will save us. And the other says, let's save ourselves from the past. I believe there could be, maybe, there could be another path. One that claims that children are always partly faithful and partly unfaithful to the world of their parents. The question is not, what is your assigned identity? But maybe, what will you do with it, through it, rather than against it? We inherit something, a place, or a tradition, or a text. And the question is, how do we create a link between the way it was experienced and the way we will experience it, or define it, or challenge it tomorrow? A link between the way it was read and the way we could read it. This is what identity is, a moving process of re-owning or re-reading what was through new means. And I think that this is somehow where we are stuck today um, in Europe and in America for very different reasons, and maybe because of different histories and heritage. Let me start with France, for example. The French nation relies upon, historically, a very simple idea that constitutes the core of the French Republic. The French Republic says it guarantees its <coughs> citizens the right to speak in the first person singular, the possibility to say I, and it says it protects that right against all possible pressure of a community all possible pressure of a group of identification, and it protects you, protects your first person singular, even from the pressure of your birth community. So you can be Jewish or Christian or Muslim, atheist, but you don't belong to a community, because the only we first person plural pronoun that transcends the individual in the French Republic is the we of the nation. For the past years, France has experienced a national crisis precisely around this identity issue. The phenomenon uh, of what we call in French communautarism, communautarization, strengthens um, a new we, um, the identification of people with their ethnic group, their religious group, their tribe, Suddenly, there is like a competition of narratives that threaten the promise of the historical French contract. And suddenly, some people claim that their ethnic or religious belonging is a we that is stronger or at least more important for them than the we of the nation. The problem with we, first person plural, is that as the French philosopher Jacques Derrida used to say, we is always abusive. <laughs> because it claims it talks for people, but it always talks in their name and pretends to be representative of a group, but it negates the fact that no group is monolithic. And people are just people with different stories and expectations and interpretations. They are not defined simply by one piece of a complex identity, a color, or a religion. Also, there is never one and only one way to experience that color or that religion. So when a group says, we, in my name, it potentially speaks in my name without being me or without knowing me. And I think America experiments this problematic, experiences this strongly today in its own way, at least from what I read and perceive from afar. The American contract is from its origin very different from the French recipe, of course. Communities here are perceived as having a positive impact on society generally, and most of the time they have, but not always. And sometimes the we, the community of a specific group, can strengthen the nation, but sometimes it can weaken or threaten it, specifically when it turns individual into a limited part of who they are, when their color, or their socio-economical group, or their race, or religion, suddenly makes no room for 
individual perception that would not fit a collective representation. And suddenly your color or your history or your name or your gender will immediately imply that you belong to a group of power or a lack of power, to a group of domination, or on the contrary, to a dominated group. And suddenly there is less and less room for the personal story, the story of an individual that doesn't have to fit exactly a collective narrative. The identity crisis we experience everywhere today can be summed up, I think, like this. How do the I and the we voices dialogue in our society? The more individual, individualistic a society is, the more people seem to be okay to be encompassed or incorporated in a collective that talk in their name. And when you become obsessed with the belonging to a collective as a way to strengthen what you perceive to be the unmoved, the eternal, the non-changing part of yourself, how do you make sure not to embrace what you still could be. How do you make sure that your community doesn't erase your name when it says it speaks in your name? How do you make sure you can always become something else and that you've never settled once and for all in an identity that ends? How do you make sure that someone who is not you can still understand you? Or to say it differently, how do you make sure, for example, that the fight against anti-Semitism is not the exclusive problem of we, the Jews? <coughs> that the fight for LGBT rights is not the exclusive problem of the LGBT community? Obviously, France and America, and America are facing parallel challenges, but they will not explore similar patterns of resolution. By the way, I think the rise in anti-Semitism in both countries today is somehow linked to this identity crisis. Um, but I believe we can learn really from each other. And also we can learn from ancient texts and wisdom, especially from, sometimes from their chutzpah, from the daring move we seem to be lacking of. Let me give you a last example from a very famous biblical uh, passage that you may be familiar with. The Hebrew people, the Hebrews in the desert, are wandering for years on their way to the promised land. Moses climbs on Mount Sinai um, and he stays away for a few weeks. You remember this episode, maybe the Hebrews are terrified. They panic. Where is he? Where is the leader? Where is daddy? He abandoned us. There's nothing in the fridge. So they build an idol. Uh, in the shape of a golden cup, and they start to worship it. And it's a very, very human thing to do. You know, suddenly you're scared. You feel that you need a tough and strong presence to make you feel less alone and more protected, and that's great, and you can touch it, you can make it shine, you're proud of it. And when Moses goes down the mountain, with the tables of the law in his hand, he watches the scene and then he has a very weird reaction. He brutally shatters the tables on the floor and explodes into pieces. How could he do this and destroy <coughs> the sacred object he had just been given? Why did he do this? Maybe, say the commentators, as a way to tell people what revelation is not a heavy and strong and unmovable object. The revelation and the sacred, on the contrary, needs to be searched in fragility and brokenness, in rifts and scattered pieces, in unfulness, and not in plenitude or completeness. And I think that what is true for golden calves in the Bible is probably true of our identities. Sometimes we worship them as metal statues out of fear, fear of absence, and fear of mourning, and fear of loneliness. And we worship certainties casted in unbroken shapes. And we forget that our identities are always, just like us, wandering in the desert on a journey. Expressions of a nomadic experience that enable us to say that we are not settled yet. 
there's always something else that we can be somewhere else, that we can go, a promised land that we have yet to reach. And on the way, we carry with us the broken pieces of the tablet, and we carry our brokenness and the inconsistencies of our stories. And we acknowledge that none of these pieces is identical to another, and these unidentical pieces, irreconcilable narratives, are precisely shaping our identities. This brokenness is sometimes heavy, heavy to carry, and uncomfortable, but it precisely enables us to move on on our journey and to accept that we are not there yet. Thank God. Excuse my <laughs> So if you're going to get some questions. I would love to. self-identity within a group cannot somehow fall into a new kind of idolatry, which has always been the counterpoint and the adversity of the identity of the Jewish people, which has been to avoid idolatry, including those pieces of the golden calf, and to believe in the everlasting, incorporeal principle that we call God that has 13 attributes. So a word about France, maybe on liberal, that was the first part of your question about uh, liberal and uh, Judaism in France. Today, um, well, uh, not today, historically, French Jewry has been shaped for the past 200 years by, uh, since Napoleon, actually, Napoleon uh, was a very good uh, strategic, military strategic uh, chief and leader, and he wanted to make sure he would have only one um, interlocutor. And so he, he created the system of consistoire with uh, at its head a uh, chief rabbi. And in a way, Napoleon created the perfect anti Talmudic recipe. Like he created the anti machloket, anti controversy recipe. He wanted to make sure there would be only one voice to speak in the name of the group. And it worked for it worked, in a way, for many years, but it ruined the possibility in France to develop pluralism. And um, now we experience a situation where the official voice of French jury is more and more um, leaning toward ultra-orthodoxy. And uh, it created a polarization that is kind of extreme today in France between forces, officially, the, the consistoire speak in the name of French jury towards the government, but actually, if you stand outside of the consistoire, today I lead a congregation in Paris that is probably the largest congregation in France, but still members of my congregation don't belong or are not represented by the chief rabbi who supposedly speak in their name. So it creates, indeed, a, a complex situation of who can speak in the name of the group, who can speak in the name of the people, which actually brings to the second part of your of your question, I mean, uh, uh, Jewish people um, has always led a very interesting internal dialogue between um, um, what is the center and what is the frontier. How do you make sure that um, the frontier remains a frontier? The frontier of the group still exists, but that it's porous enough to enable the group to move on and to remain. Alive. And I think this is the definition, I believe this, this could be a definition of what the fight against idolatry precisely is. The fight against idolatry is the fight against a God that presents itself as a Luema Sechal, is a Hebrew God of a, 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 a molded uh, form, a shape, a, a shape that doesn't move, just like a mask, 
the golden calf is actually a mask. The difference between a mask and a face is that a mask never moves. So actually, it's a, it's a real question of porosity. Judaism, we know it today, historically, remained alive because it was stable enough and unstable enough. Because something in it could um, remain yeah, stable, just like the DNA in our body. But actually, there's something that constantly enables um, what we call in, in biology epigenesis, the ability within new times and new contexts to create change. This is why I think the, yeah, I, I, th I think this is exactly, today we are in a time when people, many people believe in the DNA of their identity, of something that wouldn't change through times, that would remain uh, faithful. But I believe that life and biology and religious thought actually has shown us that life is possible only when there is enough stability and enough change in your world. Actually, something is constantly moving. Henri Atlan, a French philosopher that maybe some of you know, always talks about um, diamond and smoke as this imagery. Life can go on if something in your uh, system is strong as diamond, but moving as the smoke. And I think, yeah, I think, in a way, Jewish philosophy is demonstrated as a very powerful way of creating a dialogue between, between diamond and, and, and smoke. You just raised an interesting, ironic point. DNA turned around becomes out of the way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you for this question. <laughs> I think, you know, I think uh, in, in a way, um, this uh, epigenesis metaphor for me has always been very powerful in my approach to religious text and even religious history, I would say. Uh, the idea that, you know, uh, the, the strength of the Jewish tradition on history has really been a capacity to, to be in an epigenetic mode, and we should always wonder what enabled in such a time of history um, the, let's say, the Jewish DNA or Adonai to be expressed in such a manner, in such a place, in such a time? And yeah, this is um, this is the sacrality of the, the moving process that is, is so problematic for fundamentalism because fundamentalism, by definition, cannot tolerate this evolving mode of being, because it's always about purifying yourself from change. So it's totally incompatible with a, a philosophy of evolution. The problem, and I finished before my next question, is that people who today not only claim, but scream this, their theology of the unchanged are often perceived as the legitimate partner in the discussion. You know, it happens to me so often, you can't imagine how often it happens to me that when I talk, when I'm invited in the discussion, or even in interfaith dialogue, that at a certain point they ask me, um, um, what is your legitimacy? Uh, who do you represent? In the name of whom are you talking? And it's interesting because this question is never, never asked to my orthodox colleagues. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, like, it's as if, in a way, very, you know, very traditionalist voices are perceived to be, um, yeah, their, their legitimacy is never questioned. I think it's, it's interesting to think about that, like, where does your legitimacy comes from? <coughs> Napoleon, the Consistoire, uh, the Jewish identity, <clears throat> and Napoleon's wish that, that there should be one uh, Jewish group to whom he could speak. But I think it's important to realize that from the very beginning of France, in the beginning of the French Revolution, that the, there was a huge fight between the Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux and the Ashkenaz of uh, Alsace Lorraine, and uh, it was only by uh, a, a, a 
transfer, a very uh, important political maneuver that the Ashkenazi Jews were included as in the nation. And um, it seems to me that it's important to realize that this triage in the French, in the com Jewish community in France, um, has been there for a long time and resulted during the Second World War of the consistoire and the so-called Israelites hoping that the other Jews, if they were called Jews, if they were regarded as identical, would be eaten first by the Germans, by the French operating in the name of the Germans. So <clears throat> I wondered what has happened since then to this uh, conflict um, and whether these two communities still exist in a uh, distinct uh, conflictual way. So, the, the, the point of this where you mentioned the Second World War, there was uh, in, indeed a, an idea at a certain point that only Jews, not sporadic Jews, but Jews coming from Eastern Europe, foreigners, would be, uh, only they would be threatened by the Nazi regime and that somehow French Jews would be saved, which very fast the demonstration was made that it was just an illusion that actually everyone was threatened uh, and very, very fast. There was no difference between French uh, it's actually a national debate now in France, as you may know. People are reconsidering what was the role of Vichy in protecting or, on the contrary, uh, sending French Jews to their death. Um, but <coughs> what you mentioned before is another, of course, uh, part of French history, which happened much earlier, the conflict between the Sephardic Jewry of sovereign Western France and uh, Alsace-Lorraine. And at the time, in an interesting manner, the, the southern Jewry, the Sephardic Jewry, was much more integrated. They spoke French, whereas uh, Alsace-Lorraine Jews spoke Yiddish. And um, Napoleon wanted to make sure that the assimilation would move forward. He had a political agenda that was clear. Concerning your question, what happens today? Today, it's interesting because since the 60s, North African Jews um, arrived or resettled in, in France. And they became the living force in most Jewish congregation in France. The Ashkenazi Jewish population somehow left the synagogues. They abandoned the Jewish community. You find them in other places of the, Jew of the French nation, but for sure, if you step into a synagogue today in France, the, the, the chance are that probably you'll step into a Sephardic uh, minhag, a Sephardic traditional uh, synagogue. There are very, very few Ashkenazi-style synagogues today. Um, and it's an interesting move that happened in the, uh, in, the, in, the six, in the 60s and 70s. My congregation is an exception to that. I think that the liberal jury is France is probably the largest uh, in, in proportion Ashkenazi uh, populated. So I think in my synagogue we have exactly a 50 50 uh, fight. <laughs> but it's not a fight because somehow we included Ashkenazi tradition and Sephardic tradition into the Mina, into the prayers. Um, but there is an over representation for sure of the Ashkenazi Jewish population uh, inside the communities. But I think it's something that needs to be uh, interpreted and analyzed. How do we explain that somehow? Many Ashkenazi Jews started to feel totally alienated from the synagogue, from religious Jewish life. Uh, it's interesting today when you think about French Jewish intellectuals like Bernard Brielli or Alain Finkelkraut. So, so they are recognized Jewish intellectual figures in France, but they are very, very far from synagogue life, or from congregational life. You know, so it's, uh, that's right now. That Thank you so much for the fascinating conversation. Um, Kenneth Harris, uh, I have a question about sort of modern French life and modern French society uh, for Jews. Currently, um, you know, a lot of folks talk about sort of the Islamization of France and how France is becoming more inhospitable to Jews. And I know that there is a, um, there is, I don't know how intense this is, but there's definitely an effort to attract Jews from France to the state of Israel. Um, and then folks are taking them up on the off because they feel that it just creates a better life for them. Um, any thoughts about that? Um, yeah. yeah. So, 
the situation is very different uh, depending on where you live today in France, first of all. I personally live in Le Marais, in the city, in the heart of Paris. So I cannot say that I experience anti-Semitism every day. I don't encounter anti-Semitism. If in this position was standing someone living in the suburbs of Paris, in Sarcelles or around uh, like these cities of the, where there have been so much tensions in the past years, he would probably uh, not. Uh, he would, he would probably tell you very different uh, stories. But what is shared among everyone, and uh, among all French Jews, is the feeling that we experienced um, for the past almost 20 years now, uh, um, a situation of crisis that started with a strong uh, feeling of loneliness at the beginning of at the turn of the two, year 2000 and 2005, that there was a rise in anti-Semitism, but there was this inability by the French nation or the French government to even place a word to speak about specifically a rising anti-Semitism. There was a rise in general level of violence. There was this, you know, you know this uh, the classical import of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. You know, there were many other metaphors and words that were used, but it took time for the French nation and the French government to speak about rising anti-Semitism. But the problem is that we face a situation today that is complex and very different, of course, from what happened in the 30s in Europe, is that Jews feel that they have the public power and the government and the official and the state by their side. But actually, the threat comes from other places, and actually different places. I think you can have echoes all over the world with the situation that there is an anti-Semitic threat today coming from the extreme right and the extreme left for different but similar, in a way, reasons. It's quite complex to explore. That's the theme of my coming book. Oh, I'll come back to it's that. We were kind of used to the rhetoric of the extreme right, the anti-Semitic rhetoric of the extreme right, but in recent years, it suddenly popped out of other places, other, you know, coming from places where it was much more difficult for the French public power to denunciate this new anti-Semitism, which actually is, is, is absolutely not new. It's the good old anti-Semitism with the same feature, you know, the same feature of ancestral anti-Semitism. You, you know that it's always the same thing. Jews, they are considered to own the power, to control your life, to control the nation. And this idea of the Jewish power that goes together with all conspiracy theories is strong all over the world. You know, interesting. So, and, um, and it developed very, very strongly uh, in part of the discourse of the left and the extreme left uh, in, in France. And uh, the problem is that um, um, uh, the problem is that people who today hate the Jews in France, they also hate the government or the French Republic or the French nation. So suddenly, you know, it's like a catch-20... I never know the number. I always want to 21. I don't know. It's a catch-22. Catch that the more the Jews are attacked, the more the Jews are attacked, the more the state offers them protection, the more the state offers them protection, the more anti-Semites say, you see, they protect the Jews more than they protect us. They have this special power. They control the state because they get more protection. So the Jews are more threatened. And the more they're threatened, the more they're attacked. The more they get protection. But then the more you see, it's like it, it, it's almost impossible to break this pattern because it's a self, uh, almost a self thing. It's reinforcing itself constantly. You're threatened, so the state promises to protect you. But then it strengthens this paranoid. Um, conspiracy theory that actually the Jews get a privilege of a sort, that they have this special link to the power, 
So it's, it's very, very difficult to, it's very difficult to break this, uh, this, uh, these ideas. I work a lot in interfaith dialogue today. I work a lot in, I go to jail, to prison, a lot to work with, uh, to speak with the people who are in jail. Um, uh, I work a lot with the schools. So, and I'm not the only one. We are a group of people who are today really trying to, to be where we have to be, you know, where we can still change perceptions. But it's not an easy task, you know, there are some schools and some places in France where it feels sometimes it's, it's too late, you know, and, and it's a terrible thing to say, I'm an, an optimistic person and I, I will continue, but sometimes it feels like, I'm going to tell you like a very depressing story that someone told me recently, I invited, in my synagogue I organize, uh, every year I organize something called Shabbatan. Shabbatan is a mixture of Shabbat and Ramadan. <laughs> so during the month of Ramadan, we invite Muslim youth to the synagogue to Shabbat services, and we, we celebrate together Shabbat and we break the fast. And this year I invited a group of young people and uh, there was this teacher, and she told me that every year she organizes, she brings actors to her school, comedians, and she asks them to perform a scene of uh, discrimination. For example, if they study about uh, discrimination against the LGBT community, so comedians play the scene where a child gets, gets harassed because supposedly he's gay, and then uh, they stop the scene and the students in the room, the kids, discuss and explain why it's, it's mean and it's not okay and we should protect against bullying, blah, blah, blah. And she said that she had to stop this because uh, each time they were getting to the anti-Semitism theme, the kids in the school would all take the side of the attackers. So, meaning that for them, in the scene, when the Jewish child was attacked, they would find excuses to the person who attacks the child. So you, you, know, you can imagine a situation where uh, a teacher needs to stop the program because she perceives it to be not only not useful, but counterproductive. And this is where, unfortunately, some classrooms are already, you know, they are, you know, in past years in the suburbs of Paris, there are specific areas where there are no more Jews in, in some public school. They all left because the, the, the school was not able anymore to prevent this uh, hate uh, speech. And as you know, as you know very well, hate speech turns very, very fast into hate gestures and indeed it goes always very, very fast, you know. We have a pretty clear time, you know, January, uh, January 2014 in the streets of Paris. People scream for the first time, um, Jews uh, should leave, you know, Jews get out of France. Mm -hmm. January 2015, the kosher shop in Paris. Exactly here. <coughs> exactly. Beforehand, there were other events, of course, the death of Milan Alimi, the murder of Milan Alimi, the killing at the Toulouse uh, school. But it goes pretty fast. But I think you did experience recently in Charleston, Pittsburgh, one year. It's, it's a feeling that, you know, hate speech, we know clearly how they turn so fast uh, into deeds. So, um, so it's, it's, it's complex to answer this question because, on a, to be honest, on a daily basis, I don't feel that I experience anti-Semitism. My children go to public school and they don't experience, experience anti-Semitism. Um, but yet, there is a general feeling for the past years of, um, of, um, of, yeah, of loneliness and a question of uh, how can we build alliances of, uh, uh, of support and of protection that will not be counterproductive. We have an interesting thing in the States, and that's the repeated invocation of the quote, Judeo-Christian tradition. And that's a way for the right wing to wash itself clean of the accusation of anti-Semitism. And it expresses itself quite often, not necessarily in doing anything with Jews, but 
maybe with Israel far away, and we see that also in some European right-wing parties, that suddenly this attempt to try to wash oneself clean by traveling to Israel and visiting in the Yad Vashem and what have you, in an attempt to try to look better than what they actually are. Uh, is this phenomenon also present in France, and what forms does it take, if at all? Um, I think this phenomenon is present, of course, in the rhetoric of the extreme right in France. It is, in yes. the, the same words, the same... Yeah, um, or direct attacks against uh, Muslims um, being always defined as uh, strangers to the nation. Very recently there was this, uh, maybe some of you have heard, there was uh, uh, this uh, terrible word by Eric Zemmour. You maybe have heard about Eric Zemmour, he's a polemist in France. Close to the, the Jewish problem is close to the extreme right. You know? you know, it's an interesting time because we get weird alliances. But you know it very well here in the States. But it's, it, we never expected that alliances of this kind would happen. So today you have some weird, also in France, alliances between part of the of French Jews, the French community, but get closer to the extreme right in the name of you know, the traditional fight that you're, we share an enemy, so let's be friends, we know where it leads us in Germany. So yes, this, um, so Eric Zemmour recently had, had this terrible word where he said that uh, um, it's not okay that uh, Muslim call their children uh, Rashid or Farid or that they give the Muslim names because it proves that they don't really want to integrate. It's interesting because uh, of course, it's about it for Muslim names. You would never say that when a child is called Ilan or Etan, or that it's, there's a problem with it. So it's a way to create terrible alliances against generally the Muslim world. So, so the discussion is going on in France today. Recently, there was a book by a psychoanalyst called uh, uh, Adad. Gérard Haddad, yeah. He wrote, he wrote a book about the fact that we should stop talking about uh, Judeo-Christian uh, alliance and we should start talking about the Greco-Abrahamic alliance <laughs> and uh, to recognize what we owe to, to, uh, to the Muslim heritage also in Europe um, and to consider, this book is quite interesting, it's, it's a biblical look at uh, um, how we should read again the story of Isaac and Ismael you know, as the, actually in the Bible, Isaac and Ismael are two brothers, but the story ends well, and we never tell about the good ending of the story, because at the end of the story, Isaac one day um, is wandering in the field in a place called uh, Ber Lechai and it's a place where supposedly Isaac and his mother, Agal, live. And the story, the commentators say that actually Isaac is coming to bring Ismael back into Abraham's tent. And actually there's a possibility for the first time in the Bible of a reconciliation between brothers because the Bible, especially the book of Genesis, can easily be summed up in one sentence. I can stand my brother. <laughs> That's the sentence. So <laughs> the inability to live with your brother is the summary of the book of Genesis if you didn't read it. That's the summary. So, <laughs> but Isaac and Ismael could you know, tell another story. And it has a lot to do with the, something that could help us today, because we are dealing in Europe, and I think you know the phenomenon here, with the phenomenon of the uh, competition of the victimization. Like each one wants to prove that he suffered more or was humiliated more than his neighbor. And um, it's a terrible game to play, because um, leads us to, to disaster. And actually, we need to find ways, even in our theologies, in our re-readings re of the text, to end with, uh, or to promote what our tradition tells us about resilience. How do we get back uh, on a vertical, you know, verticality? Um, because our traditions keep, you know, I do a lot of interfaith dialogue, and we always compare the way we pray. You know, we choose praying, standing upright, and the Christian very often they kneel, and the Muslim they, they, yeah, they bow. Uh, but actually, those gestures are very different. But they share they, have, they share one commonality: the fact that in the end, you're back in a vertical position, 
like sometimes you're there from the beginning, sometimes your prayer teaches you how you can raise. You know. But I think this is really where we need to use our tradition, how we teach you. Um, exactly what I try to, to teach tonight, that actually identity is not about where you come from or what you went through. It's really about where you go from there. What, what could be of this story? Not what has been and what has always been. It's, it's about what, what yet could be, what yet could be said, what yet could be read. And, um, and I think that religious leaders who don't engage in this could be, uh, in this could be rhetoric are actually guilty of something new. Terrible responsibility of keeping people into this, uh, into this uh, victimization that supposedly gives you rights of a kind. Right. 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 Yes, I have a, actually I have a comment and a question as a someone who was born and raised in Sarcelle and his family still there. I uh, understand that sure there is a and we can the rise of several forms of anti-Semitism in the past uh, 20 years, but uh, what has what struck me, what stri struck me really coming back to France on a regular basis is that actually the level of ordinary anti-Semitism that you have in the middle class, not just in the suburbs, maybe not in the Marais, but you know, in lots of other places, mm -hmm. and also in the intellectual circles. Uh, and it's, and that is something that is very striking, the kind of ordinary anti-Semitism. That's not hate, it's just that, you know, remarks here and there. Uh, but that was a comment. My, my question is a little more about the um, about your, um, your your speech and, and, and the substance of, of what you had to say about the diamond and the smoke. How do you decide what's diamond and what's a smoke? And you know, could you get a little more in the details? And who gets to decide mm -hmm. what the core scale and what is the yeah. well. I'm sorry to tell you, actually, I think you never know. You never know uh, at what point your diamond becomes idolatry, and at what point smoke is threatening the group. You, you can never know. And I think you're always walking this thin path in your identity. You know, I always think about this gesture. Um, on Friday nights, um, I'm sorry, I'm really sounding like a rabbi now. <laughs> Uh, on Friday, <laughs> parents bless their children very often in, in like traditional circle, and you know there is this blessing that parents put their hands on a child's head, and uh, and they say, "May you be like Ephraim and Menashe." So it's "May you be like the two biblical characters Ephraim and Menashe." And when you hear this sentence, you say. Come on, can't you wish your children to be like Moses and Aaron? Can't you wish for them to be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why do you wish for them to be like secondary character, <laughs> second role in the Bible? It's, like, it's interesting because um, for different reasons. First of all, Ephraim and Menashe are the children of Joseph in, in the Bible, and they are, um, they are an example of two brothers who manage pretty well with each other. Even though they didn't receive the same blessing, you know, supposedly the oldest got the blessing of the youngest, and there was a mix in the blessing they got. But for the first time in history, even though they didn't get the same blessing, they were okay with that. And that's an example of, you know, can we finally escape these ongoing stories of uh, envy and jealousy? It's actually very linked to anti-Semitic hate because anti-Semitism most of the time has to do with the pathology of envy. I wish I had what he has. I wish I could be where he is. And like you know something of an envy that you find in, in brother problematic brotherhoods. But the, to answer your question, Ephraim and Menashe are two characters who have very weird name. They are called like this. Their names means um, Menashe in the Bible means to forget. Like Joseph, when he names his child, he says uh, that with this birth he forgot the pain of his past. So Menashe is called uh, forget in a way. It's his little name. I will call my child forget. And then his brother is born, and he's called Ephraim, which means to blossom. 
okay, to Ephraim is to like fruit and blossom. So actually, when you bless your children, you place your hand upon their head, so you place a heavy weight upon their head. So it could be interpreted as, come on, come on my child, don't move from here. You're coming close to me, you are charged with this thing, a movable weight, just like an anchor in a boat, that you're not going anywhere because I push this pressure on your head. But at the same time, while we push on their head something, a tradition, we tell them, forget and blossom. So I don't know if you, it's really subversive actually. We tell our children every Friday night, may you be able to remember to forget, to forget something and go somewhere with that and blossom. And I think it's a real blessing, you know, that parents can give to children. May you be aware of the weight of the diamond, but at the same time, may you be free as the smoke to remember enough and forget enough. So actually, we always find ourselves in this, you know, and this is why actually I think that, that, that this ongoing fight between um, between the orthodoxy and liberalism or is, is 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 kind of a nonsense in Judaism because the caricature of each motto is that orthodoxy says nothing change and liberal voices say everything <coughs> change, but all of this is lying, you know, because the truth is always this weird balance between what has to change in order for things to remain, you know. And that's difficult to do in, in education, generally speaking. How do you make sure you need enough space that something will go on and, and it will go on only if you alter it. And I said it yesterday, I don't know if it translates it in English, but my favorite word in French is by far, is altérer, to alter. You know, when you, when you say something is altered, it works in English? Alter. Alter. It says that it's used, like, you know, something is, you know, like, old and altered and used. But actually, when you listen to the etymology of this word, it comes from altéré, and it's the same word as altérité, as al, al, otherness. Something is used, um, the impact of, of time upon a matter, uh, alteration has to do with the presence of otherness, of alterité in the alteration. <laughs> the alteration is a, a, a consciousness of alterity, alter, uh, it's impossible to translate, okay, of otherness in you. And I think um, uh, this is the core of our tradition, this, um, the passage of time makes you conscious of how much you owe the other in what you are. And actually, you are what you are because something in you is totally othered. <laughs> something in you is not the same. There is otherness in you. And again, this discourse is totally inaudible. Like it's impossible for fundamental fundamentalists to hear that because this is the ruin, the, the negation of their very theological basis of the unchanged. Go back to fundamentals. Yeah, to the, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> would, is just, would you take like, one last question? Thank you. Yes, and, then, um, and then we'll thank you and invite all of you to um, stay for a glass of wine. Okay. <laughs> As you probably can hear, I'm from Germany, and um, I'm grateful to hear something what you explained about the um, development of the religion. But I have to tell you, I belong exactly to those 60s, uh, and like Karl Marx already said, the solution of anti-Semitism is that there, for the sake of reason, are no religions. And therefore, you no one should be surprised that since the 60s, and all those who are, who are active in it are not religious. I am one of them. But I, am, I live in Germany, I was born in Poland, and contrary to my uh, uh, left-wing and feminist friends, I'm Jewish, and I suffer from the rising anti-Semitism, I mean, not suffering <laughs> helplessly, 
but uh, I can't ignore that it's rising. It is hateful on one side, and but mostly ignorant. And Israel is not a place to go, to be. And so I organized uh, journeys to Israel, and for the left, not easy. But now I come back to my real question, uh, because I was so surprised you described it as very positive, that the Jews are the only ones who are fluid, who are going somewhere, who don't want to stay, and they are not the fundamentalists. It may sound very good to me, but uh, given what I hear from the anti-Semites, that is exactly what they criticize. The Jews are the wandering souls, destroying everyone else's religion and country. So what you describe positively is, on the negative side, exactly the reason for the anti-Semitism. So I'm really now scared and shattered because, but I had something positive. I was in Israel and I saw a cup and it was written on it, not every wandering soul is lost. <laughs> and I thought, that's good. I didn't know the story of you, but I drank from it and know that I'm not lost. <laughs> The Hasidic centers never ask your, your way to someone who knows the path because you might not get lost. <laughs> so it's a good thing to get lost sometimes. You know, you're right, and um, in a way, you can say something problematic now. <laughs> Anti Semites are right. You know, when they say that Jews, in a way, are a threat to the frontiers. You know, we always hear it in the anti-Semitic discourse. Actually, this is exactly what the killer, killer in Pittsburgh said. That actually, the Jews are a threat for the frontier and the porosity of the frontier. But actually, along the history, Jews have been always a threat to the hermetic frontier of our identity, the way we perceive ourselves as close uh, definitive, uh, as if something was already, you know, it's like the character of Esau in the Bible, you know, he's already, he's, he's done, he has nowhere to go, if something is, has already ended in the way he defines himself. And, and Judaism has always been about questioning the frontier. And actually, this is one piece of my upcoming book that I became fascinated in recent years by the parallel between misogyny, I don't know to and anti-Semitism. What, what, um, we, what has been the reproach toward women, or what we accuse women of along history, has a lot to do with what we accuse Jews of along history. To represent a threat for the hermetic frontier of the group, to represent porosity, openness, the risk of contamination, the encounter with otherness that will bring change in society. This is true, yeah. This is and it because it comes from the same mental territory, <coughs> a threat of, um, of a threat of a moving system, a threat of opening. Yeah. It, it always comes back to this. So you know, it's, this way we. Uh, what is interesting is that the rabbis in the Talmud are really aware of this. They're really aware that this is what the word Jewish means in the anti-Semitic minds. And it doesn't always have to do with what we really are. But it doesn't matter what you will do and how you will behave, will always be associated to the word Jewish or Jew, the idea of a risk and a threat for, for your group's frontier. And today it comes from the extreme right, but we're used to this. But what we're less used to is the fact that it comes from the extreme left and from the anti-Zionist camp, of course. <coughs> but it's the same each issue. And the question brings us back to something I alluded to a little bit in what I said before. It's the question of what does it mean to be authentically you? You know, so many people today are obsessed with being authentically them. Let's go back to the pure nation. Let's go back to the tribe, to the authentical us. And sometimes it's out of a very good, um, uh, you know, the project is really good. You know, sometimes on, on the left side of the political spectrum, you hear people telling that 
their, their tribe or their group has been contaminated or colonized by uh, the, the type of domination or another. But there is behind this weird idea of let's go back to an authentical us, an authentical self. But there's no such thing as an authentical self. I mean, I have no idea what it means to be authentically me. And this is where I disagree with Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, this famous reflection sur la question juive, and he always says the Jews should go back to what it means to be authentically Jew. I have no idea what it means to be authentically Jew, except that I think that um, this otherness makes me an authentic <laughs> Jew. And we are back to this problem of how do you define an identity, an identity if your identity is the fact that you're not identical <coughs> to where you were. You know, it's like a catch-22. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're never going to be able to... The problem is that, is that anti-Semitism is built on the idea that people want to make sure they can be authentically them, authentically French, authentically American, authentically Christian, authentically themselves. And Jews is the name of this impossibility to be complete. You know, actually in Hebrew, the word complete is the word shalom. Shalom means peace, but it means completeness. It means plenitude, complete. So anti-Semites are right. The problem with Jews is that they don't allow you to make peace, to make shalom, because <laughs> peace is the problem, you know? The possibility to be complete is their illusion. There is no possibility to be complete, because whether we like it or not, just like the little boy or story, we have no choice. We have to leave with this irreconcilable stories and rifts inside ourselves, and this brokenness is the challenge, and if you want to get rid of this brokenness, so anti-Semitism is a good recipe. <laughs> <laughs>